All right, uh, welcome back. My name is Anthony Wagner. I'm in the Department of Psychology, uh, and it's a privilege to welcome you back for the afternoon talk session, as well as to introduce our uh, three speakers. Um, our first speaker is Marion Buckwalter, um, who is here in the Department of Neurology and Neurological Sciences, as well as in neurosurgery. Um, and uh, all three speakers um, are deputy directors, past or current deputy directors of the Wusai Neurosciences Institute. Uh, Marion has been a faculty member here in, at, at Stanford since 2004 and has been, we were just chatting, uh, a deputy director of Wusai Neuro for perhaps the last seven or eight years. Uh, in addition to her clinical work, um, uh, her research focuses on improving long-term outcomes after stroke. Her lab uses basic and clinical research to understand the cells, proteins, and genes that lead to successful recovery of function, and also how complications develop that impact quality of life after stroke. One specific emphasis is on the neuroimmune uh, and glial cell responses. Uh, in 2017, beginning with the Big Ideas uh, in Neuroscience um, Award uh, from Wusai Neuro, she co-founded the Stanford Stroke Recovery Program, which runs clinical studies to understand stroke recovery and to develop new treatments. One major study, uh, Stroke COG, is a prospective cohort study uh, that is investigating mechanisms of declining memory and cognition after stroke. Uh, broadly, her science aims to improve brain health in a wide swath of the population. Uh, Marion's uh, recipient of numerous awards, including the DeMuth uh, Medical Scientist Award for Excellence and an award from the American Heart Association Allen Institute uh, in Brain Health and Cognitive Impairment. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Mar Marion. great to be here. So um, as Anthony mentioned, the topic today is going to be on stroke, which is my main research interest. So since it's after lunch and everyone's sort of toning down a little bit, I'll ask for a little audience participation. How many of you know somebody personally who's had a stroke? Okay. So stroke is very common. And um, what is a stroke? It's either a, it's a it's a problem in the brain that has symptoms and is due to a problem with blood flow. So it could be cutting off blood flow to kill a part of the brain, or it could be a bleed that's damaging parts of the brain around it. And the statistics are actually pretty scary. So if you have reached the age of 25, your lifetime risk of having a stroke is one in four. 25% of us in this room will have a stroke. And actually, more of us will have silent infarcts. Oh, that is strange. Um, <laughs> Because um, actually about 90% of, of brain infarcts are silent, meaning they occur in parts of the brain where we don't notice symptoms or they're small enough that we don't notice symptoms. So when I was in my training as a doctor and as a neurologist, I saw a lot of people with stroke. And when you talk to people with stroke, you get this kind of data. This is a, from a survey of people with stroke. You ask them what kind of problems they have. And you may currently think of mobility as a problem. Um, and actually, that is a problem. But concentration, memory, fatigue, and mood are among the biggest problems that people with stroke have, and also problems that have the least solutions compared to mobility. So that's sort of how I decided to focus my work on memory. We're also studying fatigue, but today we're going to talk about memory. And classically, people have thought about stroke as harming cognition by just taking out cognitively important parts of the brain. But if you look carefully at the data, what you see is actually that there's two phases. So there's strategic damage. Um, and I will say, note this is over 10 years. So this is a group of patients from a very famous study called the Framingham Heart Cohort, where people were followed in Framingham, Massachusetts. They collected a lot of information about their cardiovascular risk factors. And here they've matched everybody with stroke with three people who are matched for risk factors, except they didn't have a stroke. And all of these people had no dementia at the time point prior to the stroke happening. And what you can see is that at the time of stroke, there's about a 5% increase in risk of being categorized as somebody with dementia. But if you go out over this 10-year period, actually the stroke line is not parallel to the control line. The people who had a stroke within the last 10 years have about a doubling of the risk of getting dementia during that time period. And we are calling this infarct-induced neurodegeneration. Classically, it has just been thought of as these are people who are just having more strokes because people have one stroke will have more strokes. But actually, if you control for that in this study, then you still have the same risk of getting dementia. And there's a number of other lines of evidence that 
stopping the second stroke does not stop the risk of getting dementia later. So what about those silent infarcts? So the best data we have actually comes from this fabulous study called the Religious Order Study and Memory and Aging Project. And this is an early paper from the group. They have more brains than this now. But participants enter this study at age 65 or older being totally normal. So if you've had a stroke before age 65, you're not in this study. But they follow them, and they have annual cognitive assessments. They have an average of eight years of cognitive data prior to death. And then people donate their brains when they die as part of the study. The brains have been really carefully analyzed for pathology for Alzheimer's disease, but also for infarcts, including silent infarcts. And really interestingly, this is a comparison of people with no dementia versus people diagnosed clinically with Alzheimer's disease. And what you can see here is that the, this category of people that have no vascular disease is this light green here without the hatch marks. And it's very slim even in people with no dementia. These are people with normal changes in aging, normal changes in memory with aging. People diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, it's even smaller. And I took the liberty of regraphing it myself in a stroke-centric way. All the people here in red have had strokes. So it's about a third, actually 40% of the people with normal cognition, and it's about 56% of the people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease that have had strokes. So there's a hint here that perhaps having a stroke might give it might mean more likely that you'd be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Although most people have mixed pathology, meaning that most people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, their brains will have evidence of the classic Alzheimer's pathology, but also vascular diseases, including stroke. So one last piece of evidence. This paper actually came out when I was a postdoc and trying to decide what I wanted to work on in my lab. And it was kind of an aha moment for me. It was a very simple paper. They had autopsy brains from 137 people that died of a stroke. And they knew the symptoms of the stroke matched the pathology of the stroke. So they knew when the strokes happened. And all they did was they just did a simple H&E stain to look for inflammation in the strokes. And this blew me away. So we know. We know that neutrophils only come in in the first month after stroke from this. They're gone. After 37 days, none of the people had it. But really interestingly, there were mononuclear inflammatory cells in 45% of the brains. And that included about half of the brains that were decades. So these are people that died decades after their stroke. About half of them had active inflammatory infiltrates with mononuclear cells. And about 75% of them had macrophages in the strokes. So that implies, so immune cells don't tend to live decades. So that implies there's an active process where cells are coming in in some people, but not in others. So thinking about this problem, and this is the title, Making the Invisible Visible. So think about the iceberg. The top of the iceberg here is the stroke itself. And then what happens to the brain after the stroke is the invisible part of the iceberg that so far we have not been able to see. But we have a few hints here. So one is that we think this is really common, that something is happening to increase dementia risk in people with stroke. But we also think it's not happening to everybody with stroke. There's some people with stroke that have normal cognition. And we also think it's not primarily due to more strokes. And then perhaps it's related to chronic neuroinflammation. So we decided to see, could we identify infarct-induced neurodegeneration in mouse brains? And Christian Doyle was my first postdoc in my lab. He's now an associate professor at University of Arizona. And he made a mouse model of infarct-induced neurodegeneration. So you take a regular black six mouse with no genetic alterations. You give it a cortical stroke. One week after the stroke, you can see the tissue is really friable and gone here. Um, you have a focal lesion. But their cognition is normal. And they have normal LTP. So that's normal electrophysiology in their hippocampus. You wait six weeks, and one of the things you see is that there's progressive cortical thinning. You can see this hole here. The ventricle just gets bigger to fill up the space. And then there's also a dense cellular scar that turns out to be filled not just with activated macrophages, but also with mononuclear inflammatory cells, just like those human strokes I just told you about. And there, there are B cells and T cells here, as well as activated macrophages. In addition to this atrophy, there's a progressive loss of LTP. 
and there's a progressive uh, cognitive deficit that appears in these mice. When Christian takes the mice five days after stroke and ablates the B lymphocytes, those are the ones that make antibodies, that prevents the cognitive decline in the mice. So really exciting. Perhaps there's some kind of autoimmune response against the brain that's happening in these mice that's causing later neurodegeneration. And perhaps that could be treatable if people come into the hospital with a stroke. That's, of course, people with symptomatic strokes, because if you have a silent stroke, you're not going to come to the hospital. So we identified the problem, something we want to study. We made a mouse model, very cool. It has this infarct-induced neurodegeneration. So the first thing we did was actually we went back to that MAP and Ross study I told you about, and they kindly sent us some brain sections. And so we looked in the brain sections, and I will say these are people who were selected to have a minimal amount of other pathologies. So these are people with mostly lone vascular pathology. And we had people with normal cognition and no infarct. We had people with infarcts with either nor normal cognition or mild cognitive. There was one person with mild cognitive impairment. And then we had people with infarcts and dementia. And I think you can see here that there's more B lymphocytes. This is a picture of B lymphocytes in a stroke scar in people that have infarcts with dementia. Um, there's also more T cells in people with infarcts. It was actually not different between people with dementia or not dementia. So perhaps it's the antibodies. However, you'll also notice that there's a lot of people that have infarcts and dementia that have a normal number of B cells. So this doesn't look like the mice. In the mice, you're looking seven weeks later. Here, some of these people are probably decades after their infarct. And the infarct is not filled with B lymphocytes. So we didn't feel like we could go right to jumping treating people with stroke, with po really powerful drugs that would destroy B lymphocytes, because basically, we don't, we don't think everybody with a stroke is going to develop this disorder. And we don't understand how to identify people who are alive. So those people, obviously, to look at their brains, they had to be dead. Um, so we wanted to know then, what about living people? And this is actually around the time of the start of the Neurosciences Institute here at Stanford. And um, I was very lucky to be a young scientist at that time, because along came Bill Newsom, And there hasn't actually been a picture of Bill. Uh, but there's Bill, our founding director. We all know him. And one of the things that he started at the Institute was these Big Ideas in Neurosciences grant. And I wrote one, along with my colleague Martin Landsberg, who's over here, called the Stroke Collaborative Action Network. And our idea was we wanted to help. He's a clinical scientist. And I'm a basic scientist, or was at that time. Um, and we wanted to help people who are interested in stroke get access to patient samples and really provide collaboration across the university. And with the money, we actually just had a phase one award. It was only for a few years. Um, and then we got a small extension, which was critical. We were able to found the Stanford Stroke Recovery Program. So we run studies on stroke recovery. And the program is still active. We do collaborations. And we are open to collaborations from other people here in this audience or at the university who are interested um, to help people who haven't studied humans figure out how do you design a study? How do you write an IRB? And also give you access to patients. We keep a database of the patients who come to the hospital with stroke. So that's been really fun to be able to do that. And it also allowed us to start asking, well, what about living people? So what we decided to do was take living people with a stroke and ask whether there were changes in the immune system peripherally that influenced um, what was going to happen later cognitively. So what we did is we collected blood. This is only from 24 people. And I learned a lot about how to do clinical research from this study. It's, very, it's much harder than it, mice. Um, they're not in little cages, and you can't just go get them from the mouse room. Um, but what we did is we took blood, and we, we measured the complexity of the immune response with a technique called CYTOF. So we could really get a figure, fingerprint of the immunologic response. And then we used machine learning to figure out what was happening. So for example, this is, this is the peak response at two days. It turns out this response here is composed of activated innate immune cells. And when people had more of this response at two days, they actually had more cognitive decline later, which is what you see here. So really interestingly, so at the time of stroke, 
two days after stroke, we find something that predicts what's going to decline later. And this was a very small number of people. And we actually were able to use this to get additional funding, which is another really powerful thing from the big ideas. And we're now repeating this experiment right now in 200 people. And so we should have data next year to find out if this is indeed true in a larger, person, larger number of people. And similarly, so this leads to what I like to call the vaccine ther theory. And so this should be familiar to all of you. I hope you've all had your COVID shots or are about to get them. I got mine. And when you get a vaccine, what you get is you get an antigen, which means a, a piece of the pathogen. And then you also get an adjuvant, which is something that stimulates your immune system, your immune system to have a response against that adjuvant. And so we think, unfortunately, this may be happening in stroke as well. When brain cells die, they release all of their proteins. And it's not just neurons. It's all the cells in the brain. You can find them in the blood. We know they're in the blood. And we know immune cells go to the brain. And this data that I just showed you from the Cytoff study matches data that other people have also provided that you get more of an immune response against the, when the peripheral immune system is activated, you get more of an immune response. So we have now also shown that anti-MBP antibodies are associated with wor worsening cognition. And that'll, again, be something we'll be replicating in these 200 people that we're looking at currently. So it gave us some idea of what might be happening to people. But it's still not really good enough to predict like who's actually going to get cognitively worse, like especially for people with silent strokes where you don't, they don't even know when they have the stroke. And it's a sophisticated measuring technique. You can't do it on every patient in every hospital. So, but luckily, um, we were able to get even more funding. That's what the little arrows are. So that's the, the help that came after, that really was just because of that big idea award. And what we were able to do was this larger study that I'm going to tell you about next. And so this is unpublished data. And um, what we've done here is we're taking people with chronic stroke, so we can just look at that late infarct-induced neurodegeneration. And we're having them come back yearly. So this brain here is a 60-minute cognitive battery where people who are in the study volunteer. They come in. They get 60 minutes of cognitive testing. They get sort of primitive motor testing. We collect some weight and blood pressure and a number of questionnaires. And then we also collect blood. And I'm going to show you data from the first 86 people where we have cognitive follow-up. One of the key questions was, is everybody declining? Or are some people being, doing fine and other people are declining? And in what way are they declining? Because people had not defined this before the study. So, for these 86 people, we have a median um, time of 10 months for this first blood draw. And the reason for that is because it was pretty varied because we used people, people from the initial study that was funded by Wu Tsai, as well as the new people in this um, AHA and uh, Paul Allen funded study. And then our follow up time is a median of 26 months. So that's three years of time, three visits, I should say. And looking at cognitive change, this is what we found. So the first one's actually motor, actually. So motor is getting slightly better. The median is here. Each dot represents an individual person in the study. And the scale here is the change. So we're seeing how is someone after stroke? How do they change year over year? If, and this is expressed in z-scores. So a z-score of 1 means that you are one standard deviation better than expected for somebody your age. So it takes into account age, which does affect some of these things. And um, it's pretty big to have a change of one here. And what you can see is looking at the different cognitive domains, um, actually the one that's most sensitive to change early on after stroke seems to be processing speed and executive function. And this is exactly what we see in patients, is that they are slower. They might be accurate, but they're slower to respond. And you can imagine that would be really frustrating if it was you. So the next thing we wanted to do was look at their plasma and see, are there markers of who is going to get worse? So the blood draws at the beginning. And we want to know, can we predict who's going to get worse? And so we did this method called Somalogic. There's a company that uses aptamers 
to measure over 7,000 proteins in a small volume of blood. And I'll show you data from two different comparisons. So we have these 86 people with behavioral follow-up, and I'm going to split them into people doing better versus worse cognitively. And then we, we have 106 stroke people that are matched to 212 controls. The controls are from other studies at Stanford that use similar methods, and um, they're validated. So they've had MRIs, they've had cognitive testing, they're true controls. And what we see is that many things are very different. So each red dot here is significantly different. There's a number of proteins that are different. And when you do pathway analysis, I'm just going to compress into a short period of time, what you find is that markers of angiogenesis seem to be up in the plasma, and markers that um, have to do with attachment of pericytes to the outside of vessels are down. And similarly, this pathway that's really important for pericyte attachment to blood vessels is the most downregulated pathway. So that's important because pericytes need to come down onto endothelial cells. So we, what we think is happening is there's chronic inflammation in the stroke core, and then these factors basically make you make new blood vessels, but they're leaky around the inflammation. And that's often what we see clinically is there's leaky vessels around inflammation. Then what should happen is that this factor should come up, PDGFB, and block this initial phase of angiogenesis recruit pericytes, and seal the blood-brain barrier, which is one of the things that helps you resolve an inflammation. So if you want to get rid of the inflammatory response, it's a necessary step. However, the way these proteins are changed in the blood of our patients actually implies that you'd be stimulating this early leaky vessel phase, and you'd be inhibiting this later phase that closes the blood-brain barrier. And um, just one more way of looking at this that you can do. This is a correlation map. I'm just going to walk you through it quickly here. And what you see here is each circle is one of the proteins we measured. If they're together in the diagram, it means they change together. So if they're up in one person, if they're up in one person, they'll be up together. The color refers to how much it's changed between healthy controls and stroke. So the oranges and the reds are downregulated in stroke, and the blues and greens are upregulated in stroke. Here are some proteins that are significantly different and also significantly changed. Um, and there, you don't need to know what they are at this moment, but you can see PDGFB is over here. Um, and the next thing we wanted to do was to ask which of them are also different between people who are doing better or doing worse. And this is when we got really excited because actually um, there were clusters. So these, I've colored them. So these are down in people with stroke compared to healthy controls. But within stroke, they're more down. They're further away from controls when people are doing worse cognitively. And the blood-brain barrier um, affecting proteins are over here, along with some other really interesting ones. And similarly over here, the ones, like if this is in blue, it's up in stroke, and it's more up in the people doing worse. So it seems to be a continuum. Um, and this is sort of what these things do in a fairly general fashion. But there seems to be a general increased angiogenesis, decreased immune system milieu. And then the ones that are most related to cognition are over here with um, pericyte adhesion. So, when there's more change in these proteins that I had on my former diagram, actually five of them are more significantly different from control in the people doing worse cognitively. So not only are they worse in stroke, they're even worse if people are about to get worse cognitively. So it implies that perhaps a leaky blood-brain barrier and missing pericytes could be involved in this infarct-induced neurodegeneration. So we went back to our rush samples now. So those are living patients that are volunteering for our study. And then these are the autopsy specimens from the participants at rush. And we look to see, are indeed the pericytes missing in these people? And this is just an example of the immunostain. This is a stain for the endothelial cells. And this is for the pericytes, the ones that close the blood-brain barrier. And this is what we find, really exciting. So people with infarcts and no dementia tend to have pericytes around their vessels and what appears to be a more intact BBB. They are not statistically different from controls, although you could imagine if we had a few more, perhaps they would be intermediate. 
However, the ones that have infarcts and dementia, actually their median pericyte coverage is zero. So unlike the B cells, this seems to be really, really different in the people with infarcts and dementia. So it kind of corroborates the evidence from the plasma that there's the structural deficit when you have dementia. So last thing for my talk is, is there any chance we can actually see a leaky blood-brain barrier in humans? So actually we can. So this is data from, this is actually published data from my collaborator, Laura Parks. So you can use a technique called DCE MRI to look for contrast leakage in living people on a, basically a clinical MRI scanner that you could find in many hospitals in the US. And she does indeed see that there's leakage in some people, but like this person had a stroke here, but they don't have leakage. This person had a stroke here, but they do have leakage. So just like the inflammatory cells, you can see that there might be a difference. And we use this data to again move on to get additional funding. Now we're funded by the NIH and we're doing a three center study. And we're actually asking, does blood brain barrier leakage in chronic stroke actually predict cognitive decline? So if you have leakage, is it a marker that you could use to see um, who's going to get dementia? And maybe you could use it to look for a treatment effect if you wanted to use a treatment to close the blood-brain barrier, which we would obviously love to do. This is some preliminary data from the, the first 15 patients. This is just four selected ones. So, so far out of the first 15, 40% of them have contrast leakage still at um, six to nine months after stroke. We don't know yet if these are the people who are declining cognitively, but we're going to find out. And I'll hopefully be back to show you. And this data was done by Olivia Jones, who's a graduate student in Laura's lab. She analyzed the scans. So just to sum up, we now know that blood-brain barrier dysfunction is associated with infarct-induced neurodegeneration. And it, see, it may differentiate among people with infarcts who's going to have cognitive decline and who isn't. And we were able to show this in the blood, that we predict missing pericytes. In a separate set of people, we found pericytes are missing. And then in living people, we can now see what we would expect to be the result of missing pericytes, which would be a leaky blood-brain barrier. So that really just highlights that maybe we're starting to see under the water and to be able to see who with an infarct is actually going to be at risk of having dementia. And we're also gaining a much better understanding, although we have a long way to go, this is brand new, in understanding like how we might therapeutically alter this and close the BBB, perhaps, and make people not get dementia after a stroke, which is pretty much what everybody wanted. And I, I really want to thank the participants in our study. We don't have enough funds to pay them. They do this because they care about stroke and they want to help other people with stroke. They come back year after year. They get scans. We poke them. We prod them. They're great. I want to thank the Stroke Center team. These are the physicians in the hospital that are recruiting patients for us. And we now are getting up towards 300 people in the study. And then these are the people participating in the study here. We have a lot of collaborators. And then these are the people in my lab who are actually mostly working on the mouse model, which I didn't talk about today, but a lot of great work going on there. And then, of course, seriously, this would not have happened without the Big Ideas funding and the Institute. So thank you for your attention. Uh, super cool talk, Marin, as always. Um, can you quickly like help me understand where do you think the connection is between the lymphocytes and uh, the parasite leakage? Do you think the parasites secrete something or that is either preventative or attractive to those? What, what do you think at the moment, wildly speculating, is the model there? Yeah, so um, I love wildly speculating. Um, there, there's actually some really good data on leaky vessels and chronic inflammation in a different system. So chronic inflammation happens in a lot of diseases. And one of the things that happens is you get leaky vessels. So for example, people with diabetic leg ulcers, they just don't heal. They have chronic inflammation. And they also have missing pericytes on their vasculature. And if you apply PDGFB, that factor that's low here, to the ulcers, the vessels actually recruit pericytes. And then they let in fewer immune cells, and the inflammation resolves. So 
there's always a balance. Like I, I do think there probably is a autoimmune-like component to this disorder. And like many autoimmune diseases, it may kind of wax and wane. But perhaps if you can like stop, if you close the barrier and stop the leakage of brain antigens into the blood, maybe you could kind of close it up. So that's about the best I can do right now. But give me a few more years. Hi, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. I was just wondering, in your studies, are you differentiating between ischemic and uh, um, hemorrhagic stroke? And the sequelae you describe, you know, uh, leaky BBB and dementia, mm -hmm. do they differ between the two types of strokes? Have you looked at that, stratified patients? That's a great question. So, so hemorrhagic strokes are bleeding kinds of strokes. And those people, we did not take them into this particular study. And the reason for that was just because stroke is already really heterogeneous. And we didn't want to miss a signal because the people were too different. But there is, a, there, there is some data on cognition after hemorrhagic stroke that looks really similar to the ischemic stroke data that we showed here, that there, the immediate effect on cognition is more due to the lesion. And then there's a later risk of dementia. Hello, uh, Dr. Buckwater. Nice talk. I have three questions. Okay. <laughs> the first one is that uh, in terms of the loss of parasite, do you think it is the, um, the loss of them on the pre-existing vasculature or because of uh, the newly formed vasculature uh, doesn't have the shield of the parasite? And the second question would be, um, as we know, the parasite, um, in addition to the importance of the in the BBB integrity, it also plays an important role in the regulating the cerebral cerebr um, buffer, such as um, vascular, um, neurovascular coupling. So do, have you ever looked into the blood flow regulation? And finally, um, in terms of the leakage, um, did you see um, any importance of the brain lesions that may play a role in the cognitive function? Thank you. So the great questions, lots of them. So the first one was on angiogenesis. And we don't know, but based on what happens around sites of chronic inflammation, it is most likely that this is new angiogenesis being stimulated by the chronic inflammatory response. And we're working on studying that. The second one was about blood flow regulation. Most of, so the, answer, the short answer is no, we haven't looked at it. But we are looking at it in our ongoing study. So we're doing. We're doing these um, sequences on the MRIs that look at blood-brain barrier leakage, but we're also doing many that look at blood flow and structure of the brain. So we should get a better idea of that, as well as location. Location is hard. It's one of the things that makes stroke challenging is that each stroke is different and in different places. So in mice, it's much easier to just put the stroke in the same place, no problem. <laughs> but in people, it's all individual. Um, and that's one reason why I think it's really important that we're sort of starting with people after stroke and then seeing how they change. But it still could be affected by stroke location. Great. Uh, time is up, so let's thank Marian. Okay, thank you.